Chapter 6 That night, Sophie dreamed the Keebler elves were holding her hostage until she perfected all of their cookie recipes. Then, she told them she liked Oreos better, and they tried to drown her in a giant vat of fudge. She woke in a cold sweat and decided sleep was overrated. When morning came, she, t she took a quick shower and then she threw on her best jeans and a shirt she'd never worn, buttery yellow with brown stripes. It was the only item in her closet that wasn't gray. She'd always been too self-conscious to wear it. But the color brought out the gold flecks in her eyes, and today she would see fits again. As much as, as much as she hated to admit it, she wanted to look good. She even clipped part of her hair back and toyed with the idea of lip gloss, but that was going too far. Then, she snuck downstairs to check outside for him. She crept into the front yard, blinking to keep the falling ash out of her eyes. The smoke was so thick it stuck to her skin. Seriously, when were they going to get the fires contained? Looking for someone? Her next-door neighbor asked him from his perch in the middle of his lawn. Mr. Forkle could always be found there, rearranging hundreds of Narn gnomes into an elaborate tableau. No, she said, hating how nosy he was. I was checking to see if the smoke was any better. I guess it's not. She coughed for added effect. His beady blue eyes bored into hers, and she could tell from his thoughts that he didn't believe her. You kids, he grumbled, always up to something. Mr. Forkle loved to start sentences with the words, you kids. He was... He moved a gnome a fraction of an inch to the left. You should get back inside before the smoke gives you another one of those headaches you've always... Loud yapping interrupted him, and a ball of fur with legs streaked up the sidewalk, barking its tiny head off. A blonde guy in spandex jogging shorts chased after it. Would you mind grabbing her? He called to Sophie as the dog raced across her lawn. I'll try. The dog was quick, but Sophie managed to step on the leash with a clumsy lunge. She kneeled, stroking the wild-eyed, panting creature to calm her down. Thank you so much, the guy said as he ran up the path. As soon as he draw close, the dog growled and strained against the leash, barking like mad. That's my sister's dog, he shouted over the noise. She hates me, not my sister, the dog, he added. He held out his hand, displaying several half-moon bite wounds, fresh and still bleeding. One was so deep, it would I don't suppose you'd be willing to carry her back to my sister's house. It's just a few blocks away, and she seems to like you better than me. He winked one of his piercing blue eyes. She most certainly will not, Mr. Forkle yelled before she could open her mouth to answer. Sophie, go inside, and you, he pointed to the jogger, get out of here right now, or I'm calling the police. The guy's eyes narrowed. I, I wasn't asking you... I don't care, Mr. Forkle interrupted. Get away from her now. The barking grew louder as the guy moved towards Sophie. She could barely think through the chaos, but there was something in his expression that made her wonder if he was planning to grab her and drag her away, and that's when it hit her. She couldn't hear his thoughts. Even with the barking, she should have heard something. Would Fitz have sent someone else in his place? But if he had, why would the jogger say that? Why, why try to trick her? Before she could react, Mr. Forkle stepped between them, stopping the jogger in his tracks. Mr. Forkle might be on the old side. They stared at each other down for a few seconds. Then the jogger shook his head and backed off. Sophie, let the dog go, Mr. Forkle ordered. She did as he said and the dog raced away. The jogger glowered at them both before he took off after it. Sophie released the breath she'd been holding. You're okay, Mr. Forkle promised. If I see him again, I'll call the police. She nodded, trying to find her voice. Uh, thanks. Mr. Forkle snorted, shaking his head and grumbling something that started with, You kids, as he returned to his lawn gnomes. Better get inside. Right, she agreed, moving up the path on shaky legs. As soon as the front door closed, she leaned against it, trying to make sense of the sh scattered questions racing through her brain. Why would the guy try to grab her? Could he be another elf? Fitz had some serious explaining to do whatever he decided to make his next appearance. There was still no sign of Fitz when she got to school, and now she wasn't sure what to do. He might be waiting for her alone before he appeared, but after the dog incident, she wanted a few eyewitnesses around. Unless Fitz had sent the jogger to get her. It was all so frustrating and confusing. She headed for class when the bell rang, lurking a few steps behind the other students. A hand grabbed her arm and pulled her into the shadows between buildings. 
Sophie stopped her scream just in time when she recognized Fitz. Where have you been? She de Missed me bad, huh? He whispered, flashing a cocky smile. She felt the blood rush to her face and looked away to hide her blush. More like you left me alone with a ton of unanswered questions and nowhere to find you, and then this guy shows up and tries to grab me and... Whoa, wait, what guy? I don't know, she said, some creepy blonde guy who tried to trick me into wandering off with him, and when I couldn't, it looked like he was going to snatch me, but I wasn't sure because I couldn't hear his thoughts, and I think he might be another elf. Oh, uh, okay, slow down. Fitz swept his hair back. No one else knows you're here, only my dad, and he sent me to get you. Then why could I hear his thoughts? I don't know, he admitted. Are you sure you couldn't? She replayed the scene, trying to remember. There had been a lot of barking and growling, her heart pounding in her ears. She couldn't even remember hearing Mr. Forkle's thoughts now that she thought about it, and he could always hear his. Maybe not, she said quietly. Well, I guess it's that he was human, and maybe his mind is just quieter than the others. But we'll check with my dad. We better move, though. He pointed to a teacher. Leap? She squeaked as he pulled her behind the English building. I can't dish class fits. They'll call my parents. And after yesterday, I think my mom might strangle me. This is important, Sophie. You have to come with me. Why? Just trust me. She locked her knees so he couldn't pull her any farther. She couldn't keep disappearing all the time. Elf or not, she had a life here with classes and she could fail, and parents would ground her. How am I supposed to trust you when you won't even tell me anything? You can trust me because I'm here to help you. That wasn't good enough. If you wouldn't tell her what was going on, she knew how to find out. It was strange to willingly use her telepathy after trying so many years to block it, but it was the only way to find out what he was hiding, so she closed her eyes and reached for his thoughts, like the way she had the day before. The breeze brushed through her mind, whispering scattered pieces of information, nothing she really needed though. But when she pushed a little further, she found what she was hiding. A test? She shrieked. What am I being tested for? You read my mind? He dragged her deeper into the shadows, shaking his head. Hard. You can't do that, Sophie. You can't listen to someone else's thoughts when you, anytime you want to know something. There are rules. You've tried to read my mind without my permission. That's different. I'm on an assignment. What's that supposed to mean? Fitz ran his hands through his hair, which seemed to do which he seemed to do. The way he said serious made everything inside scrunch and twist together. Really? she asked quietly. Yeah, so don't do it again. She started to nod, but a small movement at a nearby oak caught her attention and she froze, her heart hammering so hard it drowned out everything else. It was only for a second, but she could have sworn she saw the jogger's face. He's here. The guy who tried to grab me. Where? Fitz scanned the campus. She gestured towards the tree, but there was no one around. No thoughts nearby either. Did she imagine it? Fitz pulled out the silver pathfinder from his pocket and adjusted the crystal. I don't see anyone, but let's get out of here. We shouldn't keep anyone waiting anyways. Who's everyone? My parents and a committee of our counselors. It's a part of the test you heard me thinking about when you broke into my head. He shot her a sidelong glance and she felt her cheeks heat up. Sorry, she mumbled. She never thought of telepathy as breaking in before, but she could see his point. His thoughts hadn't automatically filled her mind the way she did with humans. She'd shoved her way in and took them. She'd be furious if someone did that to her. She wouldn't make that mistake again. It wasn't even like she'd ever enjoyed being a telepath anyway. Reading minds always caused way more problems than it solved. Fitz took her hand and led her into the sunlight. Ready? He asked as he held up his pathfinder. She nodded, hoping he couldn't feel Chapter 7 Sophie had to shield her face as she surveyed her new surroundings. The enormous metal gate in front of them glowed as bright as sunlight, nearly blinding her. Welcome to Everglen, Fitz said, leading her towards the doors. What do you think? It's very bright. He laughed. Yeah, the gate absorbs all the light, so no one can leap directly inside. My dad works for the council, so he likes his privacy at home. I guess. After her stressful morning, it was nice to know that she, where she would be safe, but she couldn't help wondering what they were trying to keep out. She doubted King Kong could get past those massive doors. A faint click sounded, and the gate swung inward. A striking figure stood in the t small, grassy clearing, surrounded by the same enormous trees she'd seen growing along the river in the capital. A floor-length midnight cape was fastened around his shoulders with a clasp that looked like a pear yellow diamond-crusted wings. He was tall and lean, with the same vibrant teal eyes and dark wavy hair, and it was- She wasn't sure if she should bow or curtsy or shake hands. 
How should she greet an elf? She managed a shy wave. It's a pleasure to meet you, Sophie. Alden said with an accent more prominent than Fitz's. I see Fitz wasn't kidding about the brown eyes. Most unusual. She could feel her cheeks flush. Oh, uh, yeah. Alden smiled. There's nothing to be embarrassed about. I think the color is quite pretty. Don't you, Fitz? She couldn't look at Fitz as he agreed. Her face felt like it might actually be on fire. Did you tell anyone else where Sophie was? Fitz asked. Only the council. Why? Sophie said someone tried to take her this morning. Alden's eyes widened. Are you okay? He asked, scanning Sophie like she was checking for injury. Yeah, he never got close enough to grab me. He just looked like he wanted to. Humans, Alden muttered. Actually, Sophie thought he might be an elf, Fitz told him. Father and son shared a look. Then, Alden shook his head. Kidnapping is a human crime. I've never heard of an elf considering such a thing, much less trying it. What made you think it was one of us? I, I might have been wrong, she said, feeling silly and paranoid. I just can't remember hearing his thoughts, which only happened around Fitz. And now you. Yes, Fitz told me about your telepathy. He reached out to touch her forehead. Do you mind? Um, she didn't want to be rude, but she couldn't help taking a step back. <laughs> I mean you no harm, I assure you. I'd love to see your memories of the kidnapper, if that's okay. She was surprised he'd ask her her permission. Fitz was really right about the rules for telepaths. Alden placed two fingers gently against her temples and closed his eyes. She tried to hold still and avoid thinking about how good Fitz looked in his dark jacket, but as the seconds ticked by, she could feel her knees start to shake. Well, Alden said as he pulled his hands away, you are indeed a fascinating girl. Couldn't hear her either, could you? Fitz asked him, sounding triumphant. No. Alden took both of her hands. Well, I'll look into what happened this morning, but I'm sure there's no reason to worry. You're here now, and it's perfectly safe in our world. He frowned and his head jerked towards Fitz. I specifically told you not to let her leap again without a nexus. Sorry, I forgot. Sophie thought she saw the guy who tried to grab her, so we had to get out of there quick. But it's fine, I had us covered. That's not the point. Alan held out his hand, and Fitz stuck a small black cuff out of his coat pocket and handed it to him. Alden clamped a bracelet around Sophie's right wrist, twisting until it fit snug. Is that comfortable? She nodded, staring at her new accessory. The wide band had a single teal jewel set into the front, a smooth gray rectangle on the back, and intricate singles, symbols etched all around. She blinked when she realized they were letters, letters that spelled out gibberish, which seemed like an odd way to decorate a bracelet. But what wasn't odd about this world? Alden twisted the band again and it clicked with finality. There. All set. Um, what is it? A safety precaution. Your body has to break into tiny particles to be carried by the light, and the nexus holds these particles together until your concentration is strong enough to do it for you. Fitz never should have let you leap with that one, even with the stressful circumstances. But Fitz doesn't have one. Sophie pointed to his bare wrist. I got mine off early. My concentration is strong enough for three people, which is why we're fine. Sophie isn't even a bit faded, and you know it. Only fools overestimate their skills, son. You've never had to watch someone fade away. Perhaps, if you had, you'd be a little more cautious. Fitz's eyes dropped to the ground. What does it mean to fade away? Sophie asked quietly. A second passed before Alan answered, and he looked like he was w watching a memory. It's when you lose too much of yourself in a leap. Your body isn't able to fully reform, and eventually the light pulls the rest of you away and lo you're lost forever. Sophie felt the goosebumps dimple her skin. Alden's lips looked like they want to smile and he, as he motioned for Sophie and Fitz to follow him down the path. We shouldn't keep our guests waiting. Sophie wiped her palms on her jeans and took a deep breath before she followed him down the narrow path that's li lined with trees blooming blue and red and pink and purple, every color of the rainbow. The air was so thick with the perfume of flowers it was almost dizzying a nice change from the smoky air block ho back home. How exactly does this test decide my future? They're testing to see if you qualify for Foxfire. Fitz paused, like that was supposed to mean something. Isn't that a glowing fungus? She asked. Alden cracked up. Fitz looked a little insulted. It's her most prestigious academy. You named your most prestigious academy after fungus? It represents a bright glow in a darkened world. The 
light comes from fungus. Fitz rolled his eyes. Will you stop saying fungus? Only those with the strongest talent qualify for Foxfire, and if you don't get in, you might as well kiss your future goodbye. Alden then placed his hand on his shoulder. You'll have to excuse my son. He's very proud to attend Foxfire, and it's definitely an accomplishment. But don't let him worry you. The earliest levels are more of a testing ground to see who develops abilities to, and qualify them to conti continue with their studies. The idea of going to an elven academy would, made her head spin. Would she have to sneak away every day? She didn't see how that could work, but she doubted her parents would knowingly let her lightly into a secret elven school either. One problem at a time. Is it going to be hard to get into Foxfire? She asked. Counselor Brontu will be the most difficult to impress, Alden admitted. He feels your upbringing and your lack of proper education should disqualify you. Plus, he doesn't like surprises. The council had no idea you existed until today, and he's a little more than miffed about it. But you only need two out of three votes. Just do the best you can. The council didn't know about her? Then why did Fitz th say they were looking for her for 12 years? Before she could ask, they arrived at another clearing, and all coherent thoughts vanished. Dozens of squat, brown-skinned creatures with huge gray eyes tended a garden that belonged to a fairy tale. Lush plants grew up and down in sideways and slantways. One of the creatures shuffled by, carrying a basket filled with twinkling purple fruit. What? It was the only word Sophie could come up with. I'm guessing this isn't quite how you pictured gnomes, is it? Alden asked. Um, no. These definitely weren't little old men with pointy hats like Mr. Forkle's lawn statues. So, you have gnomes for servants? Alden stopped to stare at her. We would never have servants. The, the gnomes choose to live with us because it's safer in our world, and they help in our gardens because they enjoy it. We're, pl we're privileged to have them. You'll get your first taste of no gnomish produce during lunch, and you're... She peeled her eyes away from the strange scene as Alden led her out of the garden to a meadow with a house in the center. One so large, so elegant, she couldn't believe anyone would call it a home. Part castle, part manor. It was made almost entirely of intricately cut crystal, and among the numerous turrets and gables rose a tower that resembled a lighthouse. They passed through two massive doors made of, made of braided silver, and entered a round foyer, which sparkled like a prism in the sunlight. This way, Alden said, taking her hand and bringing her down the widest hallway, lined with fountains that spouted streams of colored water over their heads. The hall dead-ended at a pair of doors encrusted with a jeweled mosaic, two diamond unicorns racing a across a field of amethyst flowers. Sophie couldn't help wondering just how rich Fitz's family had to be to live in a place like this, though everything she'd seen in the elven world sp spoke of wealth. It felt very intimidating. Alden squeezed her hand. You have nothing to be afraid of. She tried to make herself believe him as Fitz pulled the doors open and led her into a formal dining room. Sheer silk curtains covered the glass walls, drawing the eye up to an enormous chandelier, and a waterfall of long, shimmering crystals that hung over a round table set with domed platters and fancy goblets. Three figures in jeweled encrusted crystals rose from the plush, throne-like chairs surrounding the table. A second too late, Sophie realized she, she should have curtsied, not that she knew how. She stared at the silver capes fastened in the base of their necks with clasped look like Counselors, this is Sophie Foster. Alden introduced with a quick bow. Sophie, this is Kenrick, Orly, and Bronte. Kenrick was built like a football player with a wild red hair and a big, toothy grin. Orly looked like a fairy princess, rosy cheeks and long ringlets. And then there was Bronte. As Sophie met his cold gaze, she could see what Alden meant about Bronte being hard to impress. He was the smallest of the three, with cropped brown hair and sharp features. He wasn't bad looking, but there was something strange about his appearance that she couldn't put her finger on. She gasped when she realized what it was. What? Bronte demanded. Five pairs of blue eyes focused on her and she stared at the floor as she mumbled. Sorry, I was surprised by her ears. My ears? Bronte repeated, confused. Fitz's whole body shook with laughter. Sophie scrimped as w one by one the others joined him. Bronte did not look at all pleased to be left out of the joke. I think she's surprised that your ears are pointy, Alden finally answered. Our ears change shape as we age. Eventually, it'll happen to all of us. I'm going to get pointy. Not for a few thousand years, Alden promised. But by then, I doubt you'll mind. Sophie sank into a chair, barely noticing that Fitz sat next to her. Her brain was on auto-repeat. 
thousand years, thousand years, thousand years. How long do elves live? she asked. Everyone looked young and vibrant, even Bronte. We don't know, Kenrick said, scooting a chair to touch closer to Orly's that he really needed to. No one's died of old age yet. Sophie rubbed her forehead. It actually hurt her brain trying to understand this. So, you're saying elves are immortal? No. A trace of sorrow hid in Alden's voice. We can die, but our bodies stop aging once we reach adulthood. We don't get wrinkles or gray hair. Only our ears age. He smiled at Bronte, who glowered back. Bronte belongs to a group we call the Ancients, which is why his ears are so distinct. Please, help yourselves, he added, pointing to the dome platters in front of each guest. Sophia uncovered hers and fought to hide her grimace. Black stripes and purple mushy glop didn't exactly scream, eat me. She forced herself to take a bite, stunned when the purple goop tasted like the juiciest cheeseburger ever. What is this stuff? That's mashed carnissa root. The black straps are umber leaves, Alden explained. Sophie took a bite of umber leaf. Tastes like chicken. You eat animals? Fitz asked in a tone that was... Everyone nodded. So she took another bite to hide her horror. It wasn't like she liked eating animals, but she couldn't imagine living off of only vegetables. Of course, if the vegetables tasted like cheeseburgers, maybe it wouldn't be so bad. So, Sophie. Bronte sneered her name like it bothered him to say it. Alden tells me you're a telepath. She swallowed her mouthful and it sank to her stomach with a thud. It felt wrong discussing her secrets so openly. Yes, she's been reading minds since she was five. Isn't that right, Sophie? Alden asked when she didn't respond. She nodded. Kenrick and Orly's jaws dropped. That's the most absurd thing I've ever heard, Bronte argued. It's unusual, Alden corrected. Bronte rolled his eyes as he turned to Sophie. Let's see how good you are, then. Tell me what I'm thinking. Sophie's mouth went dry as everyone felt silent, waiting for her. She glanced at Fitz, remembering his warnings about the rules of telepathy. He gave you permission, Fitz. Chapter 8 Sophie needed to pass. She wanted the proper education Fitz had mentioned. She wanted to learn how the world really worked. So, she closed her eyes, trying to relax enough to concentrate. She reached out with her mind, like she had the day before. Bronte's mind felt different from Fitz's, deeper somehow, like she was stretching her mental shadow much further. And when she finally felt his thoughts, they were more like an icy gust than a gentle breeze. You're thinking that you're the only one at this table with any common sense, she announced, and you're tired of watching Kenrick stare at Orly. Bronte's jaw fell open and Kenrick's face turned as red as his hair. Orly looked out on her plate, her cheeks flushing pink. I take it that's right? Alden asked, hiding a smile behind his hand. Bronte nodded, looking angry, chagrined, and incredulous all at the same time. How can that be? An ancient's mind is almost impenetrable. The key word in that sentence is almost, Alden reminded him. Don't feel bad. She's also breached Fitz's blocking. Guilt tugged at Sophie's conscience as he, she watched Fitz flush red. Especially when Bronte grinned and said, Sounds like Alden's golden boy isn't as infallible as everyone thinks. It's more likely that Sophie is exceptionally special, Alden corrected. Fitz also saw her lift more than ten times her weight with her telekinesis yesterday. You're kidding, Kenry gasped, recovering from his embarrassment. At her age? Now that, I have to see. Sophie shrank in her chair, but I don't know how I did it, it just sort of happened. Just relax, Sophie. Why not try something small? Alden pointed to the crystal goblet in front of her. That didn't sound too hard. And maybe it was like her telepathy. Another sense she just had to learn how to use. She replayed the accident, remembering the way she found the strength deep inside and pushed it out through her fingers. Could she do that again? She raised her arm and imagined lifting the goblet with an invisible hand. Nothing happened for a second, and her palms started to sweat. Then... Something pulled in her stomach, and the glass floated off the table. Sophie stared at the goblet in wonder. I did it. That's it? Bronte scoffed, unimpressed. He needed more? Seriously? Give her a second. She's still getting used to her ability. Alden put his hand on her shoulder. Take a deep breath. Relax. Then, maybe she could lift more than one thing at once. She blew out a breath, pretending she had five more imaginary hands to extend. The tug in her gut felt sharper, 
but it was worth it when the other five goblets rose like crystal flying saucers. Kenrick applauded. Excellent control. Her cheeks grew warm with the praise. Thanks. Bronte snorted. It's a couple of glasses. I thought she was supposed to be able to lift ten times her body weight. Sophie bit her lip. She wasn't sure how much more she could handle, but she was determined to impress Bronte. She must be stronger than she realized. How else could she have stopped the lantern? She took, she took another deep breath and shoved every ounce of the force she could feel in her core toward the empty chair next to Bronte. A collective gasp rang in the air as three chairs floated off the ground, including the one Bronte sat on. Incredible, Alden breathed. Sophie didn't have the time to celebrate. Her stomach cramped from all the strain and her hold broke. She screamed as the goblets chattered against the table and the chairs crashed to the floor, knocking Bronte flat on his back with a thunderous collision. For a second, no one said anything. They just stared in the open mouth shock. But when Bronte hollered for someone to help him up, everyone burst in a fit of laughter. Except Sophie. She dropped one of the counselors. She was pretty sure she'd seal her future with that mistake. Kenrick clapped her on the back, pulling her out of her worries. I've never seen such natural talent. You're even natural at her language. Your accent is perfect. Almost as perfect as these guys. He pointed to Alden and Fitz. I'm sorry, what? She asked, assuming she'd heard him wrong. Fitz laughed. You've been speaking the enlightened language since we left here, just like you did yesterday. She was speaking a different language. With an accent? Our language is instinctive, Alden explained. We speak from birth. I'm sure people thought you were an interesting, interesting baby, though to humans our language sounds like babbling. Her parents were always teasing her about the noisy, what a noisy baby she was. She gripped the table. Is there a word that sounds like soybean in English? Soybean? Alden asked. I used to say it as a baby. My parents thought I was trying to say my name and mispronouncing it. They even turned it into a nickname, a really annoying one. She blushed when Fitz chuckled beside her. Kenrick shrugged. I can't think of what that would be. Fitz and Orly nodded, but Alden looked pale. What is it? Bronte asked him, still dusting off his cape from his fall. Alden waved the words away. Probably nothing. I'll decide if it's nothing, Bronte insisted. Alden sighed. It's possible she was saying soldrine, but it's it's a stretch. Bronte's mouth tightened into a hard line. What does soldrine mean? Sophie asked. Alden hesitated before he answered. It's the proper name for a moonlark, a rare species of bird. And that's bad because... She hated the way everyone was looking at her, like a puzzle they couldn't solve. Adults were always looking at her that way, but usually she could hear their thoughts and know why they were so bothered. She missed that now. It's not bad, it's just interesting, Alden said quietly. Bronte started. Troubling is what that is. Why would it be troubling? Sophie asked. It Sophie wasn't surprised, but she couldn't fight off her panic. Had she failed? Kenrick shook his head. You're being absurd, Bronte. I vote in favor, and you won't convince me otherwise. She held her breath as all eyes turned to Orly for the final vote. Orly hadn't even said a word the entire time, so Sophie had no idea where she stood. Give me your hand, Sophie. Orly said in a voice as fragile and as lovely as her face. Orly's an empath, Fitz explained. She can feel your emotions. Sophie's arm shook as she extended her hand. Orly grasped it with a delicate touch. I feel a lot of fear and confusion, Orly whispered, but I've never felt such sincerity, and there's something else. I'm not sure I can describe it. She opened her huge, azure eyes and stared at Sophie. You have my vote. Alden clapped his hands together with a huge grin. That settles it, then. For now, Bronte corrected. This will be re revisited. I'll make sure of it. Alden's smile faded. When? We should wait till the end of the year. Give Sophie some time to adjust, Kenrick announced. Excellent, Alden agreed. Fools, Bronte grumbled. I invoke my right as senior counselor to demand a probe. Alden rose with a nod. I planned as such. I've arranged to bring her into Quinlan as soon as we're done here. Sophie knew she probably should celebrate, but she was too busy trying to decipher the word probe. That didn't sound fun. What's a probe? She asked as Fitz and Alden led everyone else out the room. Fitz leaned back in his chair. 
Just a different way to read your mind. It's no big deal. Happens all the time when you're in telepathy training, which looks like you'll be. I can't believe you passed. It looked iffy there for a minute. I know, she sighed. Why did Bronte demand a probe? Because he's a pain. Well, that, and I think he's worried that my dad couldn't read your mind. Worried? I guess maybe bothered is a better word. My dad's really good, and so am I. He flashed a cocky smile. So, if we can't read your mind, it's kind of like, who can? Okay, she said, trying to make sense of what he was saying. But why does he care if no one can read my mind? Probably because of your upbringing. She took a deep breath, reluctant to say the next words. You mean the fact that my family is human, and I'm not. A second passed before he nodded. Emptiness exploded inside of her, so it wasn't a mistake. She really wasn't related to her family, and Fitz knew. He wouldn't look at her, and she could tell he was uncomfortable. She choked down the pain, saving it for later, when she'd be able to deal with it in private. She cleared her throat, trying to sound normal. Why would that concern him? Oh, well, because it's never happened before. The warm, bright room suddenly felt colder. Never? No. It was a tiny word, but the implications it carried were huge. Why was she living with humans? Before she could ask, Alan swept back into the room. Sophia, why don't you come with me, and I'll get you something else. Where are we going? She asked as she followed Alden out of the room. Alden smiled. How would you like to see Atlantis? Chapter 9 This is Atlantis? Sophie couldn't quite hide her disappointment. They were in the middle of nowhere, on a patch of dark rocks surrounded by white-capped waves. The only signs of life were a few seagulls, and all they did was screech and poop. It was hardly the lost continent she'd expected. This is how we get to Atlantis, Alden corrected as, as he stepped across a tide pool towards a triangular rock. Atlantis is underneath us, where light doesn't reach. We can't leap there. It was hard not to slip on the slick rocks as she followed Fitz, especially in the red shoes Alden insisted she wear to match the long gown. She'd begged to wear pants, but apparently it was a sign of status for a girl to wear a gown, especially in Atlantis, which Alden explained was a, was a noble city, which meant members of the nobility had offices there. The empire waist and beaded neckline of her dress made her feel like she was wearing a costume. It was even stranger seeing Fitz's in elven clothes, a long blue tunic with elaborate embroidery around the edges and slender pockets sewn into the sleeves the exact same size as his Pathfinder. The black pants with pockets at the ankles, so he didn't have to set on the stuff he'd carried, he'd explained, and black boots completed the look. No sign of tights or pointy shoes, thankfully, but he looked more like, uh, more like an elf now, which made everything more real. A rock moved under her foot as she fell into Fitz's arms. Sorry, she whispered, knowing her face was as red as her dress. Fitz shrugged. I'm used to it. My sister, Bianna, is clumsy, too. She wasn't sure she liked the comparison. So, Atlantis really sank? She asked, changing the subject, subject uh, as she followed him to a ledge high above the water. The ancients engineered the catastrophe, Alden answered. He opened a secret compartment on the side of the strange rock, revealing... Step back. Alden uncorked the top and flung the bottle into the ocean. A huge blast of wind whipped against their faces, and the roar of churning water filled the air. Ladies first, Alden shouted, pointing to the edge. I I'm sorry, what? Maybe you should go first, Dad, Fitz suggested. Alden nodded, gave a quick wave, and jumped. Sophie screamed. Fitz laughed beside her. Your turn. He dragged her towards the edge. Please tell me you're joking. She begged as she tried, and failed to pull away. It looks worse than it is, he promised. She gulped, staring at the maelstrom swirling beneath her. Cold, salty water sprayed her face. You seriously expect me to jump? I can push you if you'd prefer. Don't even think about it. Better jump, then. I'll give you the count of five. He stepped towards her. One. Oh, okay, okay. She wanted to keep what little dignity she had left. She took a slow, deep breath closed her eyes, and stepped off the edge, screaming the whole way down. It took her a second to realize she wasn't drowning, and another after that to stop flailing around like an idiot. She opened her eyes and gasped. 
the whirlpool formed, formed a tunnel of air, dipping and weaving through the dark water like the craziest water slide ever. She was actually starting to enjoy the ride when she launched out of the vortex onto an enormous sponge. It felt like being licked from head to toe by a pack of tiny kittens. Minus the kitten breath, and the sponge sprang back, leaving her on a giant cushion. Her hands froze as she smoothed her dress. I'm not wet. The sponge absorbs the... She jumped off of the sponge to the slightly squishy ground. It felt like packed wet sand. Now, this is Atlantis. Alden gestured to the gleaming metropolis ahead of them. Sophie's eyes felt like they had to stretch to take it all in. The city was wrapped in a dome of air, which faded into the ocean beyond. Twisted crystal towers soared in the skyline, bathing the silver city in the soft blue glow radiating from their pointed spires. The buildings lined an intricate network of canals, interconnected by arched bridges. It reminded her of pictures she'd seen of Venice, but everything was sleek and modern and clean. Despite being at the bottom of the ocean, the air was crisp and fresh. The only clue that they were underwater was a muted hum in the background, like the sound she'd heard when she put a seashell to her ear. You guys build with crystal a lot, Sophie observed as she followed Alden into the city. Alden smiled. Crystal stores the energy we use to power everything, and it's cut precisely to let the right amount of light in. Of course, we had to make some changes when we moved Atlantis underwater. We plated the buildings in silver so they reflect the firelight we created in the spires and help illuminate the city. Why'd you seek Atlantis and not the other cities? We built Atlantis for humans. That's why you know the real name of the city. A long time ago, humans walked these very streets. Sophie looked around. Elves wandered the shops looking so young and elegant. The men wore heavy velvet capes like they belonged at a renaissance fair, and some of the women's gowns shifted color as they moved. Signs advertised two-for-one specials on bottled lightning or fast approval on spyball applications. A child strolled past with some sort of hybrid chicken lizard on a leash. No wonder humans invented crazy myths after the elves disappeared. They reached in the main canal, and Alden hailed one of the carriages floating above the water, a silver, almond-shaped boat with two rows of high-backed benches. A driver in an elbow-length green cape steered the, them from them the front bench. A Eurypterid, Alden explained. A sea scorpion. You're not afraid, are you? Fitz asked. She moved farther away. What is it with girls? Fitz leaned down and struck a shiny brown shell along the Eurypterid's back. Sophie waited for the pincers to slice him in half, but the creature held still, emitting a low hissing sound, like it enjoyed being petted. See? Harmless! Fitz jumped into the carriage. Alden followed, holding the door open for her. Quinlan's waiting, Sophie. It's time to find- Chapter 10 Every fiber of Sophie's being wanted to run far, far away from the mutant insect of doom, especially since it would take her to get probed. But she gritted her teeth and ran into the carriage, pressing her back against the bench to be as far as possible from the hideous sea scorpion. Where to? The driver asked Alden with a laugh. Quinlan Sondin's office, please. The driver shook the reins, and the giant scorpion thrashed his tail against the water, pulling them along. So who is this Quinlan guy, anyway? Sophie asked. Alden smiled. He's the best probe I know. If anyone can slip into your brain, it's him. Something about the word slip in gave her the heebie-jeebies. She tried to think about something else to stay calm. Why does he work down here? Atlantis wasn't a bad place, but she imagined the commute would get annoying after a while. Atlantis is her most secure city. Anyone and anything that needs to added protection is here, including your file. I have a file? A highly classified one. What's in it? You'll see soon enough. She opened her mouth to ask another question, but Alden shook his head and pointed to the driver. She'd have to wait until they were alone. The carriage entered some sort of business district. The streets were packed with elves, in all long black capes, and the silver buildings stood taller than the others, with round windows tracing down the sides and glowing signs bearing their names. Treasury. Registry. Interspecial Services. But half the signs were unreadable. What's with the random strings of letters, she asked, pointing to a building with a gibberish for a sign. I'll then try to follow her gaze. The runes? Is that what these are? She held out her wrist, running her fingers along the nonsense writing on the nexus. 
Alden nodded. That's our ancient alphabet. You can't read it? Fitz sounded more surprised than she would have liked. Being the clueless one was getting old. Fast. Alden stroked his chin. But you can tell their letters? Yeah, but it's just a big jumble. Is that going to be a problem for school? She held her breath. What would the other kids think if she couldn't even read? Nah, it's rarely used, Fitz said, and she could breathe again. Only when they want to be fancy or something. She hesitated, hating that she had to ask her next question again. Is it wrong? How was she ever supposed to fit in if she was the only kid who went home with her human's parents every night? But what other option did he ha she'd have? No way her parents would let her move here. They wouldn't even let her move across the country to go to college. How? She started to ask, but Alan cut her off. No reason to worry, Sophie. I'm sure we'll figure out it with further testing. That wasn't what she was going to ask, but the idea of more weird elf tests made her forget her other problems. She'd hoped she'd get through the next one without dropping a member of the council. They turned down a narrow, quiet canal lined with purple trees with thick, broad leaves like kelp. The water dead-ended at a single silver building, a square tower with no windows or ornamentation other than a small sign with precise white letters that read, Quinlan Sondon, Chief Mentalist. All signs of life had vanished, and the small, black door was closed tight. But the sea scorpion slowed to a stop, and Alden took a small green cube from his pocket. The driver swept across it with the cuff his, uh, above his elbow and handed it back to Alden after he made a tiny ping. Sophie's legs wobbled as she followed Alden to the door. Despite Fitz's earlier assurances, she couldn't help but wondering if the probe would hurt. Or worse, what humiliating memories Quinlan would find. Alden bypassed the receptionist in the dim foyer and headed to the only office in the back. The small, square room smelled damp, and half the space was f Please, there's no need for ceremony, my friend, Alden said with a wink. Of course. Quinlan's gaze settled on Sophie. Brown eyes? Definitely unique, Alden agreed. That's an understatement. He stared at Sophie long enough to make her squirm. You really found her after all of these years. And they still hadn't explained why they'd been looking for her. You tell me, Alden told Quinlan. You have her file? Right here. Quinlan held up a small silver square before handing it to Sophie. You lick it, Fitz explained. They need your DNA. She tried not to think about how unsanitary that was as she gave the square the tiniest lick. The metal grew warm, and Sophie nearly dropped it when the hologram flashed out in the center, two strands of DNA rotating in the air with an unearthly glow. The word match flashed across them in bright green. It took a second to, uh, for Sophie to realize she'd stopped breathing. She was a match. She really did belong. So this is why Prentice sacrificed everything, Quinlan breathed, staring at the glowing double helixes as though seeing a long-lost child. Prentice. Was that a name? And what did he sacrifice? Alden answered before she could ask. He definitely had his reasons. You'll see when they tr you try the probe. Sophie jumped as Alden squeezed her shoulders. He probably meant to reassure her, but it didn't help as Quinlan reached toward her. It's no big deal, Sophie, F Fitz promised. It'll be done in less than a minute, Quinlan added. She swallowed her fears and nodded. Two cold, slender fingers pressed against her temple. Quinlan's mouth hung open. That's what I thought, Alden muttered, almost to himself. He turned and began pacing. You can't hear anything either? Sophie asked. Part of her was relieved. She hated the idea of having her private thoughts invaded. But she didn't look like she didn't like the look on Quinlan's face, as all the wind had been knocked out of him. What does that mean? Quinlan asked quietly. It means she'll be the greatest keeper we've ever known once she's older, Alden said through a sigh. Quinlan snorted. If she isn't already. Alden froze mid-step. When he turned to face her, he looked pale. What's a keeper? Sophie asked. A second passed before Alden answered. Some information is too important to record, so we'll share it with a keeper, a highly trained telepath, and leave them in charge of protecting the secret. Then why would I already be one? Quinlan was joking about that. Alden smiled didn't reach his eyes, which made it harder to believe. Then again, the only secret she was currently keeping was where she hid in her sister's karaoke game, so she didn't have to listen to Amy sing off-key all the time. How could she be a keeper? 
Perhaps we'll talk, talk upstairs. Alden gestured to the foyer, where the receptionist was leaning towards them, making notes, clearly eavesdropping. Quinlan led them to the far side of the small office. He looked a silver strip on the wall, and a narrow door slid open, revealing a winding stairway. They climbed to an empty oval room with live footage of the brush fires projected against the walls. A cold chill settled into Sophie's core when she recognized the city. Why are you watching the San Diego wildfires? She pointed to the aerial view of Southern California. White thin lines etched into Alden's forehead as he stared at the images. Why didn't you tell me there were fires? He asked Fitz. I didn't know they were important. I didn't ask to tell me for you to tell me what was important. I asked you to tell me everything. Alden turned to Quinlan. Why were you watching the fires? They're burning white hot, against the wind, like they were set by someone who knew what they were doing. Plus, doesn't it look like, doesn't it look like the sign? Sophie had no idea what the sign was, but she didn't like the way Alden, the lines on Alden's forehead deepened. Little valleys of worry. I'm guessing this is how you found the article you sent me, Alden muttered. I'd wondered why you were looking there. We ruled that area out years ago. Article? Quinlan asked. The one about the child prodigy in San Diego led me right to Sophie. Reflections of the glowing flames made Quinlan look even more haunted as he, sh as he shifted his weight. I didn't send you any articles. Did, you, did it have a note from me? Alan frowned. No, but you were the only one who knew so uh, what I was up to. She didn't want to find out. There's no reason to worry, Sophie, Alden promised. I know this all sounds very strange to you, but I assure you we have everything under control. The calm tone in her voice made her cheeks feel hot. Maybe she was overreacting. Sorry, it's just been a weird day between the guy trying to grab me this morning and... What? Quinlan interrupted, glancing between Sophie and Alden. Was he? An elf? I doubt it. How can you be sure? Alden turned towards Sophie. Why didn't he take you? He shuddered, remembering the desperate look in the kidnapper's eyes before Mr. Forgel stepped in. My neighbor threatened to call the police. See? Alden told Quinlan, they never would have backed down so easily. They? Sophie didn't like the idea the word implied. A nameless, faceless entity out to get her. Alden smiled. I meant an elf. Any elf. You've seen how quickly we can light leap. If whenever us were really there to get you, no human threatening to call the authorities would stop them. They would have just grabbed you and leaped away. She shivered at the thought. But what, are the, what about the fires? Why are they white? The arsonist probably is a chemical accelerant. Humans do love their chemicals. I'll look into it. Alden promised. I follow suspicious leads all the time, and they never amount to anything. Humans are always doing crazy, dangerous things. If they're not lighting something on fire, they're spilling oil into the ocean or blowing something up. Every time they do, I investigate to make sure things don't get out of hand, but that doesn't mean that they will. The Council's official position is to leave humans to their own devices. That's another reason Quinlan works down here. The Council rarely takes- Alden rolled his eyes. Then his smile returned. At least she's equally bad at spying. You should have seen Bronte's face when he learned about Sophie. Thought steam might come out of his ears. Quinlan laughed. Keeping that secret for twelve years has to be a record. Why didn't the Council know you were looking for me? Sophie had to ask. Why all the secrecy? Bronte has specifically ordered us to ignore the evidence we found of your existence. He thought the DNA we discovered was a, was a hoax, and that my search was a waste of time. That's why he was so hard on you today. He doesn't like being wrong, and he really doesn't like knowing that I've been working behind his back. So, can I trust you to keep this quiet? Alan waited for Sophie and Fitz to nod. Sophie couldn't help feeling like she was missing something, so she wasn't quite ready to agree. Do you promise you'll keep me updated on the fires? Alan sighed. I will, if there's anything important. Agreed? Sophie nodded, trying to make sense of the pieces she'd learned. Why would her DNA be a hoax? How did they even have her DNA? Alden turned to Quinlan. Send me everything you have on the fires. I need to get Sophie back home. The information will be waiting for you, Quinlan promised with a slight bow. Thank you. Good to see you, my friend. Alden's pace felt rushed as he led Fitz and Sophie downstairs, bypassing the receptionist without so much as a nod. He hailed another sea scorp scorpion carriage, but this time Sophie was too distracted to care about the evil-looking creature as it pulled through them, the canals. 
Random facts floated through her mind. Prentice. DNA matches. Keepers. White hot fires wrapping around the city where she lived. A sign, Quinlan had said. A sign of what? And why couldn't anyone read her mind? She was no closer to the answer when the carriage slowed to a stop. They'd reached a small blue lagoon so far outside the city that, sil that the silver spires were nothing more than a tiny glint in the distance. Shimmery right dunes surrounded the, the small lake, and on the west shore stood a strange black statue, a narrow round base, which rose at least two stories high, topped with a wide hollow circle. An iridescent film shimmered across the center of the loop, making the whole apparatus resemble a giant bubble wand. Hold on tight, Alan said as he moved between Sophie and Fist and took their hand. She blushed when Fitz chuckled. She needed to be better about keeping her cool. But now elves could levitate? What couldn't they do? Do I want to know what you're, what we're doing? She asked as Alan steered them towards the statue. You'll see, Fitz told her. They passed through the center of the loop and the iridescent film stretched, forming a giant bubble around them. Sophie couldn't resist touching the bubble's side, which was warm and wet like in the inside of her cheek. But a low rumble coming from underneath them demanded her attention. She glanced down just in time to see a giant geyser shoot up from the lagoon and it launched their bubble.